All right, we are getting started. Any questions from two weeks ago? She has blocked out all those memories from then. Everyone have a good spring break. Relaxed, refreshed. Ish. Ish. Better than being in school last week, though, right? Anything is better than that. Perfect, perfect. Anywho, all right, let's get started. So we're continuing. We're going to finish up rheumatology and try to get through part of um, the HIV STDs uh, section. So anyway, we're talking about NSAIDs. Um, we've covered those in the pain management section already, so I'm not going to kind of belabor that point uh, much more. Just know that, you know, um, you know, pick your patient based on the type of NSAID they're going to need. You know, if it's someone with a high amount of, you know, say, a history of GI ulcer, which ones might you prescribe for them? A non-selective NSAID. Selective NSAID, because you want a COX-2 selective NSAID. What might be an example of that? Like Tordal. Hmm? is non-selective. Okay. Think like meloxicam has some uh, COX-2 selectivity. The one that has the most is Celecoxib or Celebrex, right? So always think Celebrex is being your go-to COX-2 uh, inhibitor, right? It's not totally specific for that, but it will inhibit COX-2 more so than a lot of other ones, like ibuprofen or naproxen won't really do that. It's going to be non-selective. So again, think about your risk. Think about that. Go back and review those, those uh, side effects and all of that, right? What other uh, risk could you run into from using an NSAID? What do the NSAIDs do to platelets? They inhibit them and cause uh, potential risk for bleeding while the drug is still sticking around, right? So these are things that, you know, I might ask questions on, uh, on for testing purposes. So go back and review that. This is kind of a mainstay of therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, right? Um, they're going to be using these pretty consistently because, you know, compared to other drugs that we can use for this, they tend to have a decent side effect profile, like especially compared to like glucocorticoids, right? Because, you know, glucocorticoids have a ton of side effects associated with them. Um, we can get away with just NSAID. That's going to be beneficial for these patients, right? So, again, this is going to be a cornerstone of that therapy. Um, again, basically, you can use them for osteoarthritis as well, but you're going to find that um, we like to limit that as best we can. If we can get away with just using Tylenol for those patients for more mild disease, that's going to be more beneficial. Um, but again, mainstay of RA therapy. Now, keep in mind, these do not change anything about the disease progression, so it's not going to slow anything down. This is purely for symptomatic management, okay? Make sure you're watching for... Um, you know, titrating your dose effectively, make sure the duration of therapy is going to be, um, you know, appropriate for that patient. You know, if it's OA and they're having just an acute flare-up or something, like, you can change your dose for that period of time to kind of go back to their baseline. Um, remember, you know, if they have renal disease, remember that can ha uh, cause a temporary hit on the renal function based on those, uh, uh, you know, the afferent tubule being affected by those prostaglandins not being there, right? So these are things to consider. Remember, um, COX-2 inhibitors are going to be pretty similar in efficacy to NSAIDs. Uh, Non-selective NSAIDs, I should say. So again, it doesn't really matter. You're mainly focusing on like the the GI history is a big thing there. Okay. Um, so again, low risk for GI complications. Use a non-selective NSAID. That's no problem. High risk. I'd probably use more of a COX-2 selective agent. Um, there is some theoretical risk for cardiovascular disease because remember when we had just a, a drug that was only COX-2 selective that ended up killing people, right? It ended up causing cardiovascular death. So we don't like those. So there's some theoretical risk of avoiding. COX-2 selective agents uh, in that patient population. However, I don't know if there's much data out there to necessarily support that, right? So you see something like meloxicam or peroxicam, which has a little bit of uh, some selectivity, but not a ton. Okay. So um, and we already talked about the... Did we talk about the DMARDs yet for this group? I don't think we did yet. I think we're going to get into that. So we're going to look at um, how we're going to be treating these patients. So DMARD, anyone know what that stands for? Disease-modifying Disease -modifying anti... Rheumatic drug, right? So these are going to be we're running into things like methotrexate. We're going to be looking at things like our monoclonal antibodies. So again, we're going to see that uh, based on uh, the big thing here is that these are going to be able to manage the progression of disease for RA, right? So these are going to be things that slow down the progression of disease and maintain joint function as long as we can. That's going to be the biggest thing we're going to do. This is again the mainstay of therapy. These don't really help from a symptomatic standpoint. So that's another thing to keep in mind there. They also take a while to kick in, several months as compared to something like, you know, uh, glucocorticoids going to be much quicker acting than some of these uh, medications will be, okay? So we're going to see that uh, for a lot of patients, we're going to get into specifics, but kind of follow this um, this algorithm here. You're going to find that, you know, uh, we're going to try to use kind of more 
um, cheaper, kind of non, non-biologic based DMARDs first. So that's where we're going to see things like methotrexate, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, but again, eventually they're going to end up having to go on some sort of biologic agent. You're going to see that combination therapy is going to be really important here. It's important to make sure that um, you're using appropriate combination therapy. And we'll talk about some examples of that. That's going to come up in the quiz uh, that is now posted that will be due next Friday. Okay, So this will be one of the questions that's on there regarding combination therapy, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So looking at um, specifically um, different types of combination therapy, it's okay if we use two non-biologic agents together. That's going to be totally fine there. Um, are you sure we haven't talked about these drugs yet? Yeah, we have. Okay, so we talked about the biologic agents that we can use for that. Like, so what are some biologics we can use? It's been two weeks, but if you've had this slide. You're talking about infliximab, we talked about rituximab. Guys, so we did cover those agents. So again, go back and review that stuff. Combination therapy-wise, it's important to remember that you can use two non-biologics together. So we can use things like methotrexate, we can use things like hydroxychloroquine together. That's fine, right? Um, you can use a biologic plus a non-biologic, that's fine. So I could use methotrexate plus a TNF-alpha inhibitor, something like infliximab. I can use those two together, that's totally fine. The two things you don't want to combine are going to be two biologic agents together. The risk for causing immunosuppression and the risk for causing infection in those patients is too high at that point. You don't want to do that. So I don't want to do Humira plus infliximab. That wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense because both of those are TNF-alpha inhibitors. But additionally, I wouldn't want to do something like infliximab plus Actimra or tocilizumab. Uh, one's a IL-6 inhibitor, one's a TNF-alpha inhibitor. Because again, just too much immunosuppression, too big a risk for infection. Um, it would be very effective for the rheumatoid arthritis, but they might end up succumbing uh, to infection. We don't want that to happen. Okay, and what do we test for before we start a patient on a biologic DMARD? TB, right, we're testing for TB. Perfect. Um, here's uh, some examples of traditional plus biologics that would be appropriate to use. So you could use methotrexate plus a tannercept, methotrexate plus infliximab. Usually methotrexate is going to be a good kind of backbone to a lot of these regimens because it's pretty cheap, very effective, um, you know, mild-ish on the side effect profile, not as you know low as hydroxychloroquine, but definitely more effective than hydroxychloroquine. So I see most patients end up on methotrexate for some period of time. And remember, the other nice thing is with the monoclonal antibodies, what can your body eventually develop to those? It develops its own antibodies against those, right? So there's certainly that can manifest as uh, anaphylaxis, but in more mild cases, you may find they're just there to inactivate the drug. They don't cause an anaphylactic reaction, but they'll actually bind to and, and inactivate the drug. That's no good. So what we can actually do is mix it with methotrexate, and that will actually slow down that, that, uh, that process of generating those antibodies, and we'll keep that drug, that TNF-alpha inhibitor, active for longer. So that's another kind of side benefit um, to using the, that combination of biologic plus non-biologic together, right? Um, okay, so then going on and talking about acetaminophen, so what do we know about acetaminophen? What's the main toxicity we worry about with that? Liver toxicity, right? When do you see that? Yeah, more than four grams a day. This is going to be usually with like kind of more chronic dosing. So if it took, you know, say five grams every single day for the next week or two, I'd probably end up seeing my LFT start to bump up, right? Who else might be at risk for that? You already have a bad liver, right? If you already have hepatic disease, that, that you would be at bigger risk for that. We typically drop their dose and say, well, don't take more than, say, 3,250 3, milligrams, right? So 3,250 is kind of a lower dose you normally think about for patients with renal uh, hepatic disease, I should say. And in fact, we just had a patient who had uh, intentionally overdosed on acetaminophen just not too recently. Um, and so certainly you expect to see like their LFTs rise. But when you start to have really bad hepatic dysfunction, what else starts to rise? Anyone know? Hmm? The bilirubin will start to rise as well. Yeah, that will start to spill out into the blood, and you'll start to see that. Um, the other big thing, what gets made in the liver that is useful for things like clotting? Coagulation factors, right? Vitamin K-dependent uh, coagulation factors. That's another big thing you want to look for. Look at the INR of the patient. If that's starting to go up, then you know things are really bad. That's actually showing you clotting factors are not being produced. It's almost like you're putting them on warfarin, right? Because, again, you're inactivating those clotting factors, keeping them from being made. And so, uh, you know, have a patient with LFTs only in the in the hundreds, you, know, you may not think that's too serious, but this girl's INR was three and a half, and she had no history of anticoagulation. That's bad news. Like, that's something that you know that, okay, the liver's not doing great at that point. So be really careful with the acetaminophen. It's a good drug, very safe in therapeutic doses, but watch out for the patients, you know, watch out for those chronic drinkers, they have hepatitis, anything like that, be careful with that. Okay, and so for most patients with osteoarthritis, um, yeah, this is not really going to be good for rheumatoid arthritis, it's really just not potent enough, uh, like an NSAID would be for that, because um, again, this doesn't really act as an anti-inflammatory agent, it's antipyretic, but it's not an anti-inflammatory like an NSAID is. 
So again, not good for RA, but great for OA. In a lot of cases, for more mild disease, you can start out with this. Again, we don't have any of the GI side effects like you see with an NSAID, so it's kind of beneficial from that standpoint. And it's pretty cheap. You find this very easily. You can get a big, you know, 55-gallon drum at Costco basically for like $2, it seems like. Uh, very easy to get a hold of. Now, other things we can do, if we have, say, a limited number of joints that are being affected here, we can use topical agents uh, that can be applied locally, and that will help to mitigate a lot of the systemic side effects. Okay, so that can be beneficial, um, but not good if you have a lot of joints being affected. So if it's only like, say, the knees are being affected, that's fine. If it's the knees, the hands, the hips, you know, everything being affected, that's not going to be as, as, as great. Because, again, topical agents are typically not as um, uh, thought of as favorably as, like, a pill you can take, right? So a lot of you take a pill and have to apply a cream, say, multiple times a day to, to your joints, right? So one of the things we can do is a topical inset. We have some aspirin-based products, uh, something like aspirin cream. We also have uh, diclofenac or Volterran gel. That's another uh, good one uh, that patients can apply just locally and get that nice kind of local anti-inflammatory sort of effect. It's going to be great. Um, this is usually better for uh, osteoarthritis used um, for more kind of mild disease, a few joints being affected here, right? And it's going to be preferred in older patients who probably shouldn't get NSAIDs due to the you know limited risk on bleeding effect, limited risk on GI effect, um, you know, so it's going to be really good from from that standpoint. Other things we can use capsaicin. We talked about that during the pain management section, right? We can use that for certain neuropathic pains. Remember how it works? Deplete substance P, right? So it helps to desensitize those pain fibers. Uh, what's the key points to remember with that? Have to be consistent. You have to use it, uh, you know, two to four times a day, every single day, because otherwise, once you stop using it, that substance P starts to build back up again, and those nerves are going to be firing the same way as they were before. What's the other big education point? Wash your hands, soap and water, not just water, because again, that stuff is very lipophilic. You need something like uh, some basic soap in order to help, uh, you know, get rid of that. Otherwise, what could you use? Gloves, make sure these gloves. I would recommend that actually because you're going to have a lot easier time uh, just taking gloves off and you're done. You don't have to worry about having any kind of residual left on your hands, right? So I would recommend that to patients. Um, good as an uh, adjunct, very effective for most people who use it consistently, but a lot of people don't like it, kind of burns, stings at first. Um, when you first start using it, so a lot of people are not very compliant, doesn't get a lot of good use, but very good uh, effective drug there. Other things you might use occasionally, some counter irritants, things like menthol, camphor, kind of cause kind of a hot cooling sort of sensation over the area. Um, again, uh, how compliant they are with it is going to determine how effective it's going to be for them. Right? Okay, other things we can do, we can do intra-articular corticosteroids. So this is typically something like triamcinolone, or probably the most common one that I see, and basically just inject it right into the joint itself to deal with that inflammation that's there. Um, this is good for uh, potentially rheumatoid arthritis. This is good for potentially osteoarthritis, um, especially for like knee and hip uh, joints with osteoarthritis specifically. Um, it's good if it's uncontrolled by things like, you know, NSAIDs or acetaminophen alone. The one thing is you don't want to use it too frequently. Anyone remember why we don't want to do that? Yeah, it can break down the tissue. You can actually cause further joint damage over time, cause tendon atrophy, things like that. So you don't want, it's very, very effective at dealing with the pain. However, you don't want to use it too frequently. So not more than every three months, probably say two to three times a year max uh, for most patients, right? So keep that in mind. Okay. Um, for osteoarthritis, you typically don't like to use opioids unless you got nothing else. So if like if Tylenol is not working, if the intraarticular steroids are not working, nothing else. This is where a lot of patients, you know, especially uh, with like chronic osteoarthritis, end up getting on opioids. And then once you're on opioids, it's very difficult to come back off of those unless you actually deal with the baseline problem. So unless you get that knee replaced or that hip replaced, it's hard to get rid of, uh, um, you know, it'd be nice if we get those hands replaced, but you can't really do that yet. Unless we have like robot hands we can use maybe, but most patients don't want to do that. However, um, opioids, you know, once you get on them, it's very difficult to come off of it. Remember all the side effects we talked about. Remember the constipation. Remember the respiratory depression if you take too much. Um, anyone remember the reversal agent? Naloxone or Narcan. That's definitely what we're going to use for those patients to reverse that effect. Um, so just keep those in mind. Again, uh, the biggest thing you worry about with chronic use is addiction, right? You worry about physical dependence. You worry about addiction. Not everyone's going to become addicted, but it is a uh, road... You know, it's at least a, it's a stop on that road uh, going down that pathway, right? So the longer they're on it, the more likely they are to develop that physical dependence. And again, that can turn into addiction if you're not managing that pain effectively. Um, other things we could use potentially glucosamine and chondroitin. Sure, people have probably heard of this before, or seen it like in the pharmacies. Um, basically, this is a natural product we find in the cartilage and the synovial fluid, and they're thought to kind of increase cardioglycan synthesis and try to help repair some of that cartilage that's being kind of graded or being uh, degraded 
and just normal wear and tear with osteoarthritis. Again, this is just purely for osteoarthritis for these patients. Um, it's shown some moderate effect uh, in, in decreasing or in improving osteoarthritis symptoms. However, it's not going to be the thing that uh, you know completely cures them. So it's a good adjuvant, it's a good add-on sort of agent to maybe help um, kind of repair some of that uh, cartilage, but it's not going to really fix the baseline problem, right? But it's a good thing to add on potentially. You do want to be uh, careful of is you know it's relatively safe. However, um, I do have to worry about shellfish allergy. So the glucosamine um, is going to be coming from a shellfish source. There's actually I was looking at this up uh, the other day. There are non-shellfish sources that you can get this from. So again, if they had that allergy, I would probably recommend finding one of those sources. And again, it's very important for patients to be consistent with their dietary supplements because um, again, there's not the same regulations as uh, from the FDA as you would see for typical drug-based products. Um, and so you want to make sure they're getting a good quality product, staying consistent, and that way the dose is going to be pretty consistent. At least you're more guaranteed to see that. Okay. Uh, occasionally, you can use hyaluronic injections, and so this is another intraarticular injection. doesn't have the same issue as the corticosteroids because, again, this is really just trying to replace this kind of natural constituent of the synovial fluid. It has some anti-inflammatory properties and can help to reduce some that pain and maybe increase a little bit of mobility in the joint there. Um, typically, you'll give it once a week three to five weeks or so, and you kind of go through uh, repeated courses as time goes on, depending on patient symptomatology. And it's nice because it's relatively free of side effects. So as long as you have a good, um, yeah, no you know, infection is in, you know, uh, started by causing that injection, as long as done, everything's done sterile, um, typically free of side effects, which is beneficial. Okay, so you're looking at hip and knee osteoarthritis. Again, it's a natural kind of, uh, of kind of flow chart. You can start with the easy things first for more mild disease and kind of build up as time goes on or as disease gets worse. So for instance, you know, if they have no contraindication of acetaminophen, start with that. Start with four grams a day, maybe less if they have history of hepatic disease uh, and go from there, see how they respond to it. Um, again, if it's only one joint or one or two joints being affected here, think about things like, um, uh, you know, topical insets. Think about things like, you know, capsaicin being a factor for these patients. Um, now, if they shouldn't receive acetaminophen, that's where you're going to have to jump to using things like topical products, um, intraarticular corticosteroids, that's when you have to start using alternative agents. Um, however, if that's not working, you know, if you need a second line agent, this is where you start to think about opioid analgesics, you think about surgery. Um, there actually is some evidence for using duloxetine, which anyone remember what type of drug that is? It's an SNR. I use it occasionally for knee only osteoarthritis. Um, again, there's some evidence to show that may have some benefits there, maybe something to do with the, the nerve transmission of pain signals. Who knows? But it's a, it's a kind of a backup sort of thing there. They can start with the acetaminophen and go from there for most patients. I've attained osteoarthritis. This is where um, you may end up having to use more NSAIDs or relying more on NSAIDs. Again, if you use topical, that's going to be beneficial, especially if they're older. You don't want to cause any hits on the renal function or bleeding risk or GI function, anything like that. And then again, you're going to be kind of going down the, the, the pathway. Um, look at how effective it is. Try using combination therapy if needed uh, to try to get that pain under control for those patients. Because again, it'd be nice if we could do surgery, but again, there's not a lot of options as we would see with something like knee or hip uh, osteoarthritis. Okay, so any questions on osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis? You guys probably forgot most of what happened last Friday or two Fridays ago. It's okay, I understand. Um, all right, so continuing on, osteoporosis and osteomalacia. So who's likely to get osteoporosis? Older. Older. I think women as well. Guys can have it too. Um, but what's one of the big things that leads to having osteoporosis in, in older women? Yeah, postmenopausal, they start to lose estrogen formation or the estrogen production goes down. This is when you start to see a lot of this start to pop up. So uh, some of the things we're going to look at are going to be targeted towards estrogen uh, function, especially in these uh, older female patients. So uh, what, what is osteoporosis? Have you guys covered this at all? What is it? Hmm? Decreased bone density. And what's kind of the, the process? Why is that happening? Too much bone being taken up, not enough being laid down, right? Because again, the bones are constantly being turned over. You have osteoblasts to do what? Produce new bone, and we have osteoclasts that break it down, right? So again, there's a normal balance that happens with otherwise healthy patients. There are things that can influence this. Hormones can affect this. Different uh, calcium levels and, and vitamin D levels can affect this pretty significantly. Um, these are all things to consider and making sure when we're uh, trying to fix this problem or trying to prevent this problem, we're going to be targeting these things first. Okay. Um, and again, what's the problem with having osteoporosis? Why is it a bad thing to have decreased bone density? The brittle. They get up in the middle of the night, they have to pee, they fall, they have a fracture, 
everything goes to hell after that, right? A um, lot of morbidity and mortality associated with having a fracture, hip fractures, vertebral fractures, femur fractures, all of these things are really, really bad. Because again, it's very difficult for older patients to regain that function after they've had a break like that. So again, we want to uh, focus on preventing the disease first and foremost. And then when we're actually treating it, make sure we get that bone mineral density back up uh, and try to prevent a fracture. That's the ultimate thing we're trying to do here, okay? So a um, lot of drugs that can affect this, right? So again, some of the ones we've kind of talked about, uh, at least uh, in passing, um, I don't know, have we talked about aromatase inhibitors? We haven't done um, the female stuff yet. The, no, we'll get there eventually, but there's a class of drugs called aromatase inhibitors. These are actually drugs that prevent the uh, conversion from progestins into estrogen. And if you prevent that, or things like testosterone into estrogens, by preventing that, you prevent, uh, you cause estrogen deficiency. We know it's going to have a negative effect on the bone. That's no good, right? Um, furosemide. What happens with furosemide? You're, it's a diuretic, right? So what are you peeing out? Pee out calcium, right? So you end up losing calcium in the urine. So if it's not there in the, in the bloodstream, it can't be laid down in the bone, right? That's one thing you can see. Um, proton pump inhibitors. Why do you think this could cause decreased bone mineral density? This affects calcium absorption, right? So calcium needs to be in an acidic uh, medium in order to be absorbed very well. So you start to increase the pH by giving a proton pump inhibitor. Chronically, you can see decreased calcium levels, decreased uh, bone mineral density, right? So these are things to consider. Always look at the patient's medication regimen to see what could be playing a role here. What are things you can def uh, fix from this standpoint instead of having to add on new drugs, right? It's always going to be better if we can use fewer drugs for our patients whenever possible, right? Much as I would like to keep a job, I don't need that much job security. There's plenty of people who need 15 drugs, but if you can get your patients off of as many as you can, it's going to be good for them, right? Okay, so again, delicate balance between the osteoclast and the osteoblast. Usually these patients are going to have increased activity of the osteoclast. We're having a lot more bone resorption. Um, estrogen can affect this. Testosterone, is this going to have a positive effect on the bone or a negative effect? Typically positive, right? So when you have older guys, they start to have uh, decreased testosterone levels. You can also see bone mineral density start to go down. How about PTH? What is that? Parathyroid hormone. What does parathyroid hormone do? It regulates phosphorus, but more importantly, it regulates calcium. calcium, right? So what stimulates release of PTH? Low calcium, right? So low calcium levels, low vitamin D levels, because right, vitamin D is very important for affecting calcium levels as well. Got to have both of those. If both of those are low, PTH levels start to go up, right? PTH is going to start to increase osteoclast activity. You're going to start to pull up that uh, that uh, calcium from the bone. That would be an important feature here as well. There's going to be several drugs that are going to target this. So again, we're going to be focusing on trying to um, mitigate the effects from these hormones and trying to make sure we keep uh, the balance on the osteoblast side as best we can. So uh, as we mentioned here that uh, PTH is going to affect not only the renal uh, excretion of calcium and, and things like phosphorus, but it also is going to affect the absorption of calcium from the GI tract. That's kind of the other, uh, we, we can affect the excretion, but we can also affect the portal of entry, which is typically the GI tract there, right? Um, big thing to note is, is that the normal vitamin D that you take, like say in your diet or the thing that you make in the skin, you know, especially if you sit next to the window. I always wanted to do a study where I looked at the vitamin D levels of patient, or students next to the, the window versus the students over here to see if there's any appreciable difference. But um, did you hear eight hours a day practically? So you, know, you think they find some difference, but um, regardless, uh, you know, is that the active form of vitamin D? No, you have to activate it, right? So there's going to be two step process. The first hydroxylation occurs in the liver. That's not the active form either. And then it has to go into the kidneys and have a second hydroxylation, and that's the active form, right? This is this 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Other name, calcitriol. If you ever see calcitriol, that is typically going to be used in patients who cannot produce their own calcitriol. Think renal patients, think hepatic patients. These are the ones that need that replacement, okay? So they need that active form. This will stimulate calcium absorption from the GI tract. It'll also stimulate calcium reabsorption from the kidneys, okay? Mm -hmm. These are gonna be beneficial things to the bone. If you lack vitamin D, you're gonna end up having uh, less calcium absorbed, less calcium being reabsorbed from the kidneys. You're gonna have low calcium, or hypocalcemia. That's gonna stimulate PTH, because PTH is gonna go straight to the bone and say, hey, we need to start raising up this calcium. And that's what leads to that decreased bone mineral density, right? So again, it's gonna be this negative feedback loop that is not being activated appropriately. So. What we want to do, um, and again, a little estrogen, uh, estrogen deficiency can also cause increased osteoclast activity. So the, this is the other major component we're going to focus on for our postmenopausal patients. 
So prevention is the key here. If we can start early, screen our patients early, look at their Z scores and all that fun stuff, try to make sure bone mineral density is, is adequate, this is going to be uh, the best thing for them. Because again, it's very hard to get all that bone density back rather than just try to keep it there where it is in the, in the first place. Um, Again, once the fracture actually occurs, the main thing is trying to um, prevent, you know, further falls and fractures. Usually one fall kind of begets other falls as it goes along, but they're going to have a lot of pain, potential deformity. You know, we want to make sure we're keeping their functions up as best we can. So if we can prevent that, that's going to be beneficial overall. So non-pharmacologic therapy. So these are things they should be either getting in their diet or we can supplement with uh, some pharmacology. But calcium is a big thing. That's why you always see old people eating their tums, right? Some of it's for their GERD symptoms, but the other feature of it is going to be for the calcium they need for their healthy bones, right? So again, you can get this from your milk, you can get it from uh, tums, you can get it from wherever you need to, but you need your cal uh, calcium there. Usually 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day is typically beneficial or, you know, is adequate for most patients. However, there are some side effects, mainly being what? Constipation. Calcium is very constipating, right? What else? Kidney stones, so they have a history of nephrolithiasis. This can exacerbate that, right? It's another big thing. Um, certainly, hypercalcemia is a risk, but typically these patients are probably hypocalcemic, if anything, to begin with. So the other big thing is there's lots of drug-drug interactions where this will bind up other drugs, right? Or if I'm drinking milk, it'll bind up things like my iron. It'll bind up my um, potentially thyroid hormones. It'll bind up um, uh, bisphosphonates, which we're going to talk about for osteoporosis in just a second here. Be aware of that. Make sure you separate it out. Okay. Um, vitamin D is the other big component here. And again, this is the non-activated form. So again, if they have a healthy liver, healthy kidneys, they should be able to produce that themselves. Um, certainly here being in, in sunny Florida, if you can say get outside, they can start to produce some own vitamin, uh, of your own vitamin D. But often we have to supplement that. And a lot of the milk we have nowadays is going to be fortified with vitamin D. And so that way they can get good absorption of that as well. Usually 800, 1,000 units a day is going to be good for these patients. Um, a lot of them do require exogenous uh, supplementation. Uh, either in their diet or in, in just actually taking a tablet that has this. Um, but normally what you're going to find out there in like pharmaceutical products will be either ergocalciferol or cholecalciferol. Those are the two main forms. This is not active. But once they go into the liver, it'll turn into calcifidiol, and then calcitriol is what gets formed in the kidney. So this is the active form. If you see a patient who's on calcitriol, they probably have kidney disease. That's uh, the most likely thing they probably have in, in uh, affecting their calcium levels there, right? Okay. So uh, typically our medication is going to be needed to either treat osteoporosis if it's already established or to try to prevent it, right? So again, this is all about disease progression prevention if we can. Um, typically, you're going to find a lot of postmenopausal women or men greater than 50. Um, you're going to start treatment if they already have osteoporosis or if they have kind of a high uh, risk of having a fracture within the next 10 years. So say, for instance, 3% or more, or if they have a 10-year probability of developing osteoporosis-related fracture of 20% or more. These are kind of the cut points you'd say, okay, let's go ahead and start therapy here, right? So um, looking at our different options for anti-resorptive therapy. So again, this is just meaning we want to keep the calcium in the bone where it's at. Um, we talked about calcium and vitamin D already. We're going to talk about our bisphosphonates. Anyone know any examples of bisphosphonates? You guys have covered this already? So things like your Boniva, your Fosamax. Like we'll look at some examples of that. But uh, you've probably at least heard of uh, one or two of these before. Um, we have our estrogen agonist slash antagonist. We'll talk about our, our selective estrogen receptor modulators. So if you ever hear CIRM, that's what that's referring to. We'll talk about some examples there. Um, and then a few other drugs like calcitonin, uh, denazumab, estrogen, testosterone. So we'll look at some different options there. Were CIRMs used in chemo? Too? They were using chemo. Do you remember what they were used for? Used for breast cancer, right? Remember when um, uh, we use things like raloxifen or tamoxifen, they act as an antagonist in things like the breast tissue, but they might act as an agonist elsewhere. So that's why we like raloxifen because it's an antagonist of the breast tissue, uh, but it acts as an agonist in the bone. Okay, because right? a lot of the problem with dealing with breast cancer related therapy, especially if it's estrogen sensitive, if you deplete all that estrogen, it just doesn't affect the breast cancer, it affects the bones as well. That's the other big thing we, we see issues with, right? So again, uh, Monkey with hormones, you monkey with a lot of different systems, right? Because it affects kind of everything. Okay, so the bisphosphonates we have, we have a few. Uh, we have alendronate, ibandronate, and risedronate. These are the main oral options we have available. And we have one IV option that's available here. It's called zoledronic acid. Um, basically, what they're doing is they're mimicking a product called pyrophosphate. It's actually a natural uh, substance that your body produces um, that inhibits osteoclast activity. So basically it gets deposited into the bone. You actually find that the, the duration of the half-life of these drugs is super, super long because they get deposited in the bone and they kind of stay there for a good long time. Um, so basically they're going to decrease uh, the osteoclast number. They're going to be able to uh, increase the lifespan of the osteoblast. Um, 
up in the number there. Um, so again, it's going to help uh, with several features there to make sure the calcium is there in the bone stays there. So uh, some of the things to note here is that they have very low bioavailability. Okay, so the key thing here and the key education points to remember is that the patient has to take it on an empty stomach with just water, not with their milk, not with their coffee, nothing but a glass of water, right? Eight ounces of water early in the morning, first thing in the morning, they have an empty stomach, and they need to take it sitting up, right? One of the problems you run into with bisphosphonates has a tendency to get adhered to the esophagus, and you can see esophageal erosions for patients who maybe take it and then lay back down afterwards, right? Don't want to do that. Make sure they need to be able to stay sitting for at least 30 minutes, if not an hour, after they get up and they take the medication. Okay, that's the biggest thing there, because again, if you have any food on your stomach, if you take it with any milk or anything, the bioavailability is going to be negligible. Okay, and so you can have your patient come back in, you're like, well, your bone mineral density keeps going down, and they say, I swear I'm taking it. The next question to ask is, how are you taking it? What are you taking it with, etc. Okay, that's a big point there. Um, so if they cannot do those that follow that and they cannot you know say sitting for half an hour or they can't um comply with this that's where they have to use the iv option the iv option is nice because you only have to give it one time a year uh versus the other agents you may have to give say weekly or several times a week um it can be beneficial from that standpoint so it just depends on the patient which one you might need to do the other big thing um you're going to find most commonly is probably gi upset related to that and i mentioned the esophageal erosion um the other kind of uh the zebra sort of thing that doesn't happen very often but if you hear about it it's probably related to this is this osteonecrosis of the jaw okay don't really know the mechanism for why that happens but it is a known rare side effect something to, to warn patients about if they have any kind of like jaw pain or anything like that would be something to, to be worrisome yes ma'am um they may not want to pay for it um it may not be as convenient for patients to come and get that done there's uh it could be several things that go into it um you know certainly from a convenience standpoint it might be nice for a patient just to, to do that once and be done for the year um but it may not be it can be prohibitively expensive for others right so it depends on what their kind of situation is yeah Okay, so I mentioned six to eight ounces of water, no other liquids. Um, the, the amount's not really so important, just really the fluid you want to take with it is important there. You need to be sitting on for at least 30 minutes there, okay? Um, again, dosing is based on the specific product, but usually can either be weekly, monthly, or as I mentioned, the zoledronic acid is yearly. So that's a good long half-life there. It gets deposited in the bone, it just stays there. Okay, another one which we'll use uh, less commonly, but uh, based on the name, what do you know about already? Monoclonal antibody, absolutely. So again, this is one that actually binds to this protein called uh, RANKL or RANKL. Um, basically, it will prevent um, this RANK receptor from being activated. It will prevent this RANKL from interacting with that, and it will prevent uh, the these osteoclast precursor cells from being activated. Right, so you're kind of stopping the osteoclast from being generated in the first place. Um, again, this one would be used if you failed this phosphonate therapy that still wasn't working. You still had decreased bone mineral density. Um, again, this wouldn't be dosed every six months. So again, a little more frequently dosed there. Um, However, we do have some risk uh, for things like you know, infection happening here, typically skin infection from where you're injecting it. Um, and you can have bone turnover suppression, which may lead to some uh, more brittleness of the bones over time. Um, the density might be okay, but it may just not have that good sort of, um, you know, because it's a, it's a healthy process to have your bone kind of uh, be recycled uh, over time. But if you kind of lose that, you may see some, uh, you know, decreased integrity of the bone over time. Okay, so looking at our, actually we'll talk about OB-GYN a little bit later. Just know that with raloxifen, it's going to be acting as an agonist uh, in the in the bones. No, it's going to be acting uh, uh, in place of estrogen. However, it's going to be an antagonist in the breast tissues. So that's kind of the benefit you have there. Again, you can look at your chemo slides, have a little bit more information there. But um, what side effects do you think you might expect to see with this? Because it also acting as an antagonist in the uterine tissue as well. Yeah, you can see hot flashes, you can see menopausal type symptoms uh, associated with that, you know, vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, things like that. So again, keep those side effects in mind um, that can come about from this. But again, if it's, uh, you know, an older patient uh, and they're, you know, have osteoporosis, it can be a really good agent for them. Uh, you know, again, you don't have to worry about the breast cancer risk, the uterine cancer risk, anything like that. So again, uh, we'll look at that more in detail a little bit later when we hit the ob guidance section. Uh, I think it's probably in the last section of the class if I had to guess. I haven't looked at the schedule, but... We'll cover that there. Just know here though, though that it's acting as a mixed agonist antagonist, agonist in the bone, which is important for osteoporosis, antagonist elsewhere. Okay. Okay, another drug we have is called calcitonin. Um, this is going to be not recommended for osteoporosis, but may be used for other things um, like hypercalcemia. We use this occasionally, um, but if they failed kind of other therapies, this may be used uh, occasionally for osteoporosis patients. Basically, it's kind of interesting. It's a uh, an endogenous hormone. 
um, and basically it opposes the action of PTH. You can think of PTH, uh, the kind of the, the opposite uh, acting hormone is going to be calcitonin essentially, right? Um, so for instance, you have insulin. What's the counteracting hormone with that? Glucagon, right? So you think of that, that kind of relation there, PTH and, and calcitonin. Um, what's interesting is the calcitonin we have is actually produced in salmon sperm. That's where we actually harvest it from, which is interesting. I don't know who made that discovery, but that's where we get it from. Uh, this is actually an intranasal medication. It actually comes in the nasal spray that the patient will absorb from the nasal mucosa. Um, problem here is that a lot of the, the bisphosphonates show decreased risk of you know hip fractures, vertebral fractures. This one really only works on vertebral fractures. Uh, at least that's what the evidence we have so far. So again, not preferred because they have these other risks for fractures still being present there. Um, more often used in hypercalcemia, but we'll talk a little about that a little bit more in the, in the endocrine section later on. All right, another drug called teriparatide or Forteo. Um, this is going to be another uh, uh, one that's used as a backup if patients are failing bisphosphonates, um, you know, high risk for fractures as well. This one is basically has uh, the first 34 amino acids of PTH, so it kind of looks like a chunk of the PTH, which you think would not be beneficial because you think PTH is one of the problems here. However, um, it actually acts as a uh, stimulant for bone, uh, laying down the bone, see more osteoblast activity happening here. However, when you have all this increased osteoblast activity, you worry about those uh, cells kind of replicating kind of, uh, you know, too much. And then that turns into potentially what? Cells are just kind of replicating on their own regarding cancer. You worry about cancer. So there's actually a REMS program. You remember REMS programs being for drugs that have really nasty side effects you have to monitor for. Um, this is one of those things. So bone cancer can be seen with this. So again, not preferred. It's probably a second or third sort of line agent for his patients with osteoporosis. Okay, so again, uh, I'm not going to go over this uh, in much detail, but just know that as you start to have more and more sort of uh, worrisome scans, as you start to show bone mineral density going down, or if you have um, these risks that are being calculated for a certain, you know, 10, 10 years or so, um, this is when you want to make sure that you're at least doing calcium and vitamin D at a baseline. Most patients should be taking this anyway, especially if they're postmenopausal to get older. So I'd probably recommend that just to anyone, right? Anyone should get their vitamin, uh, vitamin D and calcium in. Uh, but then once they start to show high enough risk, that's when you want to start considering things like adding on a bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonate is always going to be your first line drug from that standpoint. And then if that's not working, that's when you can start to use backups. So you can use things like the teriparatide or calcitonin. Um, but those are rarely needed. Most often, you're just going to use the bisphosphonate for these patients. All right, any questions about that? All right, the last section here we'll talk about is gout briefly. What is gout? Your acid levels are high or low? High. They're high, and then what happens? Precipitates out in the joint. What's the joint you most think of? The big toe, the great toe. I don't know what's so great about that toe. I think pinky toe's all right, but I guess uh, that's true. You do need to walk. Um, Anywho, so again, this is going to be basically a spectrum of diseases that are kind of uh, uh, manifested as a result of hyper, uh, hyperuricemia, I should say. Um, again, is it only the great toe that gets affected? It happens elsewhere, right? So it can happen in pretty much any joint, potentially. Um, and there's going to be some things that can precipitate this. So what are some things that might lead you to have hyperuricemia leading to, to precipitate out in the joints? Decreased excretions of kidney. So, yeah, so kidney issues, you have decreased excretion, dehydration is another big one. Anything else? Huh? Shrimp. shrimp. Okay, so yeah, foods are high in purines. Uh, I didn't know shrimp specifically, but okay, I'll go with that. I usually think high protein sort of diets, right? Uh, I can't eat shrimp anyway. I'm allergic to it, so I don't usually think of that. So, I don't know. It's okay. I'm more uh, bummed out by the avocado allergy that I have because guacamole and, and sushi just you can't do most of it, so it's terrible. I don't know. I guess what's the point of living, right? So, just kidding. Anywho. Um, Right, so the issue, the, the big things we're going to focus on here are either looking to decrease production of uh, uric acid or to increase excretion of it, okay? So when we say um, there's going to be urate lowering therapy, there's going to decrease the production of uric acid, or there's going to be um, uricosuric drugs, which just means peeing out the uric acid, right? So there's going to be things that will help to lower it. Then that's going to be for prevention of gout. The other thing we're going to do is going to be treatment for the actual acute gouty attacks. Okay, so we're going to see, make sure you kind of know what the difference is between those two, which ones are good for acute attacks, which ones are going to be better for maintenance, right? So again, um, big issue here is that one, uh, you can have a lot of buildup from waste products, especially of like uh, purines being broken down. Um, so you think a lot of protein in the diet. Um, who else might be at risk for having a lot of purines being broken down all at once? Where do you find a lot of purines? Meat, but you also find like in DNA, right? Who has a lot of cells being killed off all at the same time? Cancer, cancer patients, right? So there's, uh, there's an issue called tumor lysis syndrome. 
that can happen for these patients where, uh, especially if they have really severe um, leukemias, they have a ton of white blood cells that are around, you go and you lyse all of those by giving a big dose of, say, like methotrexate or something, all of a sudden all the cells start to die off, they release all these purines, they start to get broken down into uric acid, and guess what? All that can precipitate out. That can actually be um, a, a cause of renal failure for those patients because, again, the uric acid may precipitate into kidneys, uh, which is no good. So, again, it's a, it can be a potentially life-threatening complication of that. So we'll look at one drug we use for that specifically. But um, again, the issue is either overproduction or we're going to be under excretion, right? So we need to look at that um, and we can kind of target that based with our drug therapy, right? So um, again, with our goals here, we, if they're having a, an acute attack, if it's the first presentation, fix that first. And then we want to try, to try to prevent any recurrent arthritis from happening here. And then obviously preventing kind of long-term uh, issues of like chronic, chronic deposition of the uric acid crystals. Um, so the main thing we're going to look at is going to be anti-inflammatories for the acute attacks and then urate lowering therapy for uh, prevention. So looking at the acute attacks and the non-pharmacologic therapy, you can try using ice there, but anyone know how painful a gouty attack is? It hurts. Uh, I always think of this like old timey picture where it shows like a little devil with a pitchfork kind of poking the guy in the toe. Um, so I think it probably hurts pretty bad. I've never experienced it, but uh, I can say it hurts. So ice is probably not going to cut it. It might be good for the first couple minutes or so. Um, but this is where we're going to use a lot of NSAIDs. So NSAIDs are going to be a cornerstone of therapy here. So we're going to use uh, uh, corticosteroids potentially as a backup. The NSAIDs really aren't doing it. And again, this is something where if they have recurrent gouty attacks, you'd probably send them home on a prescription for an NSAID. You know, something like a Celebrex, they have GI history, um, meloxicam, something like that. Um, and then if they are you know, continuing to have issues, they need to come into the ER or somewhere to get uh, treated. This is where corticosteroids can be utilized. I mean, get like kind of a short dose uh, course of, of steroids. And then we have a new drug called colchicine. Anyone heard of this drug before? Anyone know where it comes from? Which is a plant source. You ever seen autumn crocus? That is uh, where we get colchicine from. So I'd like to point out the plants we get drugs from. Um, and again, therapy should start early. Uh, earlier the better. And your patient's probably going to want that because they're in a lot of pain. And then um, utilizing combination therapies really should be relegated to her. Uh, they're having multiple joints that are being affected here or uh, having really severe pain where one thing is not really kind of working for them. So again, look at the NSAID slides again, but know, you know who's going to be better for based on their history. You know, high-risk CV patients, you probably want to focus on a non-selective. High-risk GI patients, focus on a COX-2 selective. And then looking at the corticosteroids, again, we like to prevent use of these as much, much as we can, but they have pretty equivalent efficacy to our NSAIDs. Um, you can use them orally, but again, you see a lot of systemic side effects from this. However, if it's only like a single joint being affected, intraarticular injection can be used as well. So something like triamcinolone, your kinolog, that's just the brand name for that. Uh, once two or more joints get affected, that's when you kind of need more systemic therapy, right? And so um, just remember, if you need to be on corticosteroids greater than a week, then you got to taper them off of that slowly. Otherwise, you worry about adrenal suppression, right? So again, any more than a week. Probably shouldn't need more than a week, but depending on how severe it is, who knows? Uh, so we have colchicine is a new drug here. So this is an antimitotic drug. So basically, this actually prevents um, replication of a lot of those kind of rapidly dividing uh, immune cells that are there at the site of inflammation. Um, it kind of works on those mitotic spindles. Remember when you have like mitosis that's occurring there, you have the mitotic spindles that pull the chromosomes apart. This interferes with that, with that uh, uh, process there. So kind of arrests the mitosis. Uh, it works at a different site than uh, some of our other cancer drugs, you, think, uh, you know, things like atopicide and, and drugs like that. Um, However, in gout here, by, by preventing that, you can kind of inhibit those, those neutrophils from coming into the site and inhibit some of their migration and will help to limit that inflammatory response. And so um, really only is used for gout. I don't, I've never seen anything else where colchicine has been used for uh, from a pain uh, perspective. And then you need to use it pretty early. It tends to lose efficacy over time because once all those uh, neutrophils have kind of migrated in, causing that inflammation is kind of, uh, kind of behind the eight ball at that point. Uh, biggest side effects you see with this is a lot of nausea vomiting. Uh, and in fact, the old dosing guidelines used to be that you would take uh, colchicine, say like every 30 minutes to an hour until you threw up. And then once you threw up, then you couldn't take any more. So it's kind of a weird to see dosing, like dosing to toxicity rather than uh, just purely to efficacy. However, um, you don't want to give too much because this is actually can be very uh, toxic to lots of other cells. And so you can see things like neutropenia potentially if you're uh, using too big of a dose. You can see um, uh, you know, neuropathies that can develop from this. So again, it's a very toxic drug, especially in high doses. Uh, so you can be very careful with that. Make sure they're not taking more than they're supposed to. So again, looking at their pain intensity, again, for initial monotherapy, NSAIDs, colchicine, corticosteroids, any of those are going to be equally efficacious. My bet, I would probably go with an NSAID first line, if anything, unless they uh, have a history of saying, well, I haven't really ever responded to NSAIDs. I like colchicine a lot better than I might go with that. Um, 
and then if they need uh, combination therapy, you know, uh, you can use complementary mechanisms, NSAID plus colchicine or corticosteroids plus an NSAID, something like that. And then uh, based on their outcome, then you can start to look at, um, you know, once that is resolved, then we're going to go down to the urate lowering therapy, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Okay. So looking at things to uh, non-pharmacologic things to prevent gouty attacks, so we can maintain lower uric acid levels can be good. Limiting alcohol intake, because again, alcohol is typically dehydrating, right? Because it inhibits ADH release. So you end up, uh, once you break the seal, start to lose a lot of fluid, you can see dehydration and more likely to see that precipitation, right? So that's one thing. Um, there's some medications that can raise uric acid levels. So a lot of our diuretics can do this acutely. So you can see thiazide and loop diuretics do this. Uh, things like niacin, remember where we saw it, niacin being used? hyperlipidemia, we use it to raise our HDL and lower triglycerides. Even low dose aspirin can do this as well. So again, there may be things to try to get them off of those drugs if possible. May not be though. Um, however, we can just add on uric acid lowering therapy as well. That could be another thing we can do there. So typically if they've had recurrent attacks, this is the person I would initiate uric acid lowering therapy for. Um, especially if they have any kind of like chronic kidney disease, urolithiasis, history of that. Uh, any of those things would uh, kind of uh, Predispose me to want to go ahead and use your rate lowering uh, therapy for these patients. So we'll look at uh, a couple of different options here. Again, some of these can be used to increase excretion, but more often we're going to be using things that decrease uric acid production. So we're going to look at our xanthine oxidase inhibitor specifically. So this is the process of uh, generating uric acid. These are at the bottom. Um, I'm not going to make you go through this with excruciating detail. The main thing to know here, though, is you have an enzyme called xanthine oxidase. And so this is working on the tail end of the process here. And again, this is where you're having breakdown of these um, purines. Tail end of the process here is where xanthine oxidase is producing uric acid. So if I can inhibit this enzyme, I can have more of uh, this buildup of hypoxanthine. that can just get eliminated in the kidneys. It does not precipitate out and cause gout like uh, uric acid does. So we're going to find some drugs that can do that. Do you know any drugs that do that? We talked about gout. It's kind of the main thing to prevent allopurinol. Allopurinol is going to be the main drug that does that. This is our, our oldest drug that we have that does this. And so widely used for prevention of, of gouty attacks. Um, there are some uh, rare skin manifestations that can happen here. You can have uh, things like toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is similar to Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, so again, watch out for skin stuff. If they notice a rash and things like that, they need to be wary of that. Um, the other newer one we have, and this is still brand name, I believe, and so it's more expensive, but it's called Fabuxostat or Euloric. Um, again, much more better tolerated, but also much more expensive. So if you think get away with allopurinol, go ahead and use that. Um, otherwise, you may need to switch over to Fabuxostat. And then from a uricosteric standpoint, so again, if you want to increase renal release, I've not seen this used too, too frequently. However, it is an option. We have a drug called probenicid. Um, the other thing, though, is that if you increase the secretion of uric acid into the renal tubules, what do you run the risk for? Those, yeah, the crystals form in there, right? So you can see urolithiasis form. Uh, so again, there's a risk of actually inducing that, which is, again, not the thing you want to do for your patients. However, some patients, if they cannot take febuxostat or your allopurinol, this may be something they need to add on here. So again, the, that's the, the biggest thing to warn about is they can precipitate those acute, uh, those acute gouty attacks. Um, they can also do things like uh, in, uh, will increase levels of other uh, antibiotics, so especially penicillins and cephalosporins. And in fact, you may actually see a few different regimens where they'll give a penicillin plus probenicid because that actually prevents excretion of it and you keep the drug around for longer. You have to give it less frequently. Because way back in the day, uh, this, is a, this is a very old drug, but way back in the day, back when it was hard to make penicillins, we want to keep it around in the system as long as you can. Because you remember how often you have to give penicillin? Like four to, uh, four to six times a day, right? And it's one of those time-dependent antibiotics, and you keep it around for a while. So if I give the, you probenicid, that would actually prevent you from peeing it out. You keep it around for longer and kill it as bacteria. So you may see that used occasionally. I think I was just looking at a um, treatment for pelvic inflammatory disease, and one of the things they recommend is using a, a second-generation cephalosporin plus probenicid to prevent how often you have to, to give the cephalosporin. So one thing you might see out there. Okay, and then for that tumor lysis syndrome you mentioned, this is a very expensive, uh, not often used drug, but it's called raspiricase. We have to use this occasionally over at the Children's Hospital for these kind of new onset leukemias. Um, and basically this is a uh, recombinant form of an enzyme called urate oxidase. And basically just cleaves uric acid, it makes it more water soluble and you can eliminate it. Very, very expensive, however, so we don't like to use it unless they're really at risk for having kind of overwhelming uric acid levels due to things like uh, chemotherapy. And so, um, you know, it being an enzyme, uh, we're a protein we're injecting, you know, there is risk for anaphylaxis, so you have to watch out for that. Um, and so it's a really just a very good drug, very effective. However, only really like to use it and hold up for those uh, cases of tumor lysis syndrome. Okay, 
So again, looking at urate lowering therapy, again, look typically at trying to do dietary modifications first, try to get them off any medications if they don't need to be on them uh, that can raise uric acid levels, and then focus on um, xanthine oxidase inhibitors first, right? So you want to use allopurinol, fluvoxastat. If they cannot tolerate either of those, then probenicid is going to be your go-to drug. Uh, and we mentioned kind of the, the treatment for acute attacks there. So any questions on that? Pretty straightforward. Again, start with allopurinol. If that doesn't work, then you can move on from there. That's usually going to be what most patients would tolerate pretty well. Okay, so let's do a break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about... Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um, Go ahead. Uh, well, you typically, if you would ever do that, and I've not seen that done very frequently, but it would be a pretty low dose compared to like an actual treatment dose. Um, I'd probably say I've never seen anyone on that personally, but I've seen a lot of people on an allopurinol uh, for prevention. So, you know, I don't think it's done as, as frequently. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back and start our talk on infectious disease.